Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, a major ag lender says the Delta could lose a lot of farmers if the farm economy downturn lasts longer than expected. In the food factor, oatmeal. There's more than one kind, and Natasha will have some new ways to prepare it. In Southern Gardening, the Bougainvillea. It's tropical and its beauty is enough to enchant you. In the market, soybeans are the big winner in this week's USDA report, but the trade throws the brakes on the recent rally in the cattle sector. In the feature segment today, it's a laboratory where tough love is handed out. The Mississippi State University Trial Gardens at Starkville evaluates landscape plants so they'll perform in your yard. It also wants you to stop by for a look. It is a trial garden. Um, it's not really a display garden. So as you walk around, you do see things that are diseased. You do see things that bugs are eating on. Um, because one of our, our philosophy with the trial garden has, has been to um, treat these things the way a homeowner does. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. The leader of a major Arkansas ag lender says the present downturn in our farm economy could result in a lot of Delta farmers going out of business. Leighton, Greg Cole is the CEO of Ag Heritage Farm Credit Services of Arkansas. Delta Farm Press reports that Cole made his comments before the Mid-South Agricultural and Environmental Law Conference. Cole said a Purdue study found that uptrends in the farm economy tend to last five to seven years. The so-called not-so-good times last 10 to 12. Cole says the present downturn started in 2014. He says it could last a total of five to seven years. Cole says if the downturn does last longer, the Delta could lose the bottom 25% of all its producers. He does not, however, see a return to the horrible farm economy conditions of the 1980s. Oatmeal has always been known for being a hearty breakfast food, but not many of us are aware it comes in a variety of ways. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes with Mississippi State University Extension tells us about the different kinds of oatmeal and some delicious ways to prepare them. Everybody knows about oats, right? But what about groats? or the difference between old fashioned and steel cut. And this segment is all about oatmeal. Oats taken straight from the field are inedible for humans and must have their protective outer hulls removed to get to the healthy whole grain inside, known as the groat. From there, it's how these groats are processed that will result in the different types of oatmeal we find at the supermarket. Old-fashioned oats are steamed and flattened with a roller, resulting in fine pressed flakes. This hearty variety can be used for a quick batch of oatmeal on the stovetop or serve as a popular additional ingredient for baking. Quick cooking oats are rolled flatter, steamed longer, and cut into smaller pieces. The finer flakes absorb water very quickly, making for a smooth and creamy textured oatmeal that can be stirred up in less than two minutes. Steel cut oats have been sliced into fragments instead of rolling them flat. The Irish style porridge is a slow cook favorite with a thick, chewy texture and nuttier taste. Regardless of your favorite variety, oatmeal can help lower cholesterol levels, making it a heart healthy breakfast. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Oatmeal contains soluble fiber, which makes you feel fuller longer and it can help prevent overeating. Well, let's check on crop progress now with the Mississippi Ag Statistics Service. These numbers represent conditions as of last Monday. There's still excess soil moisture in the state, but there's a lot less than there was. Top soil moisture was 
Uh, surplus in the state as of Monday, that's down 18 points from the week before. It's adequate in 64%. 6% uh, of the state has short topsoil moisture, very short, 2%. Mississippi corn planting is basically finished. 94% of the crop is planted. That's up five points from the week from the previous week. That's right at the five-year average. 88% of the crop has emerged, which is also close to the five-year average. State cotton planting is running close to the five-year average. 35% is planted. That's up 14 points from last week. 16% of the crop has emerged. Rice is still running ahead of average. 80% of the crop is planted. 14 uh, points more than the five-year average, 65% of that has emerged. 57% of the Mississippi soybean crop was planted as of Monday. That's up 11 points from the previous week and ahead of the five-year average. Emergence is running close to average. 39% of the crop has sprouted. Mississippi peanut planting is running right at its five-year average. It's 27% complete. 5% of the crop has emerged. Watermelon planting was 67% complete as of Monday, and that's just two points behind the five-year average. Mississippi winter wheat crop is moving rapidly toward maturity. 88% of the crop is headed, 20% of it has colored, and that's 18 points ahead of the five-year average. Well, its thorns can look intimidating, but its color will win you over. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman with Mississippi State University tells us about the Bougainvillea, a tropical transplant that can give years of enjoyment. I think one of the classic summer plants for our Mississippi gardens has to be Bougainvillea. This tropical plant is perfect in a hanging basket or container on the porch and patio. Today's Southern Gardening is visiting Rivers Nursery for a good look at these plants that require little care and can return many years of enjoyment. These Bougainvillea baskets will develop long arching branches as the summer progresses. Be careful when handling because of the sharp thorns on the stems. The flowers are available in a variety of colors, but did you know they're not actually flowers? They're really modified leaves called bracts and have a papery texture and surround the white tubular flowers. Best growth is achieved by full sun exposure. These plants are also heavy feeders and will benefit from monthly applications of water-soluble fertilizer. But the plants actually require very little irrigation, so be careful not to overwater in between feedings. Bougainvillea will begin to bloom in the spring and fall. The flowers are produced in cycles of about six weeks, followed by a rest period. Bougainvillea can be pruned any time to keep the plant neat. Pruning after a flowering cycle will encourage branching, which leads to more flowers during the next bloom cycle. In the fall, Bougainvillea should be brought inside and placed in a window with high light for indoor flowering to brighten the winter months. The Rivers family brought this plant into the greenhouse many years ago, and look how it has grown into a Bougainvillea tree. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. And Leighton, uh, where I grew up down in South Florida, they mm -hmm. grow in the ground. <laughs> Don't have to bring them inside. No problem. Gary says other than protecting the Bougainvillea in the winter, that it is an easy care plant. And our feature segment today will take you to a research facility at Mississippi State University where the public is encouraged to observe. It's the MSU Trial Gardens in Starkville. Time now for the markets with Leighton. And you say we got a little shake up on Tuesday. Some surprises, that's the key word, surprises, in this new set of supply and demand numbers that came out. This week's soybean stocks come in well below expectations. Relatively favorable growing conditions are now forecast for cotton, as higher grain prices put the brakes on the recent rally in cattle. The biggest surprises from this week's WASDE report had to do with soybeans. The USDA lowered old crop ending stocks quite a bit, and new crop stocks were below many pre-report estimates. Now, most bean contracts settled Tuesday evening with gains of more than 50 cents a bushel as a result of what the new monthly report had to say. On the corn side of the ledger, the supply-demand numbers are said to be pretty much neutral. Old crop corn stocks were down from last month. 
but the USDA is expecting big new crop ending stocks. The USDA also reduced corn production outlooks for South America. Now that's the situation analyst John Roach was concerned about even before Tuesday's report was released. We're also into a weather worry in South America. The, the Mato Grosso uh, second crop corn, the Safrina crop, I think they pronounce it, uh, uh, has been uh, faced with dry weather conditions and, and, and warm weather conditions. Uh, there's some rain in the forecast out a week from now, but, but it's still quite dry until then, and people are pulling the yields down. We've seen estimates taking the, the crop down as much as 8 million tons. Um, and so uh, we have a, su a supply changing in South America. Uh, in addition to that, we've had demand suddenly come alive. This week we saw the biggest export sales week on corn we've had in four years. So buyers who've been reluctant to buy because they saw no reason to suddenly had to come to the trough and pay up money in order to get some, and they're still short bought. And I think we have taken in a lot of the farmer selling. The cotton market, meanwhile, basically looked bearish in reaction to that new supply-demand report. Analysts report the WASD showed the largest ending stocks of cotton in eight years for the 2016-17 crop. Global stocks, meanwhile, are projected to decline over 6% as China continues to release more low-cost, low-quality cotton from its big stockpile. Well, the cotton world has been focused a lot on China of late as the long-anticipated auction of some government cotton stocks took place. How is this impacting and will it continue to impact the cotton market? Well, I don't think this in and of itself has, has really impacted the market. Um, when, you, when you go back to the markets and look at kind of how, it, how they've done in the last couple months, really since March, they've been on somewhat of an upward trend even knowing that this this was going to happen, that these auctioning these auctions were going to happen, mm -hmm. um, and they've really only started to come down about a week ago, a little over a week ago. Um, so I don't think this is really hitting the market. Um, looking forward, so far China's only sold about thirty thousand tons of their cotton, and their goal is to sell two million tons um, by August. So uh, there's still some time for that to really have an impact on the markets. So that being said, is the, the trading range we have seen and are in right now as far as December futures here, at the midpoint of May, is that likely to be the way things continue? Well, it's really hard to tell, but from, from the way the markets are, are, are acting right now, it kind of looks like there's a bearish trend starting to kind of pick up a little bit. Um, I know last week we had a, a jobs report that came out that was less than, less than ideal and so I think that's probably hitting the cotton markets a little bit and then you know going into into the next few weeks uh, looking at planting progress and growing conditions will also probably have a a big impact on markets as well. And that brings me to my next question the planting progress uh, what are you hearing what are you uh, picking up maybe is there any kind of indication that maybe soybeans are picking up some what was going to be cotton acres or any changes like that? Well, as of right now, uh, the, the information I have is about a week old, but as of a week ago, uh, cotton and soybeans were both ahead of schedule in terms of planting. They were both, you know, about 10% ahead of where normal is. Um, corn was right on schedule. So with everything being either on schedule or slightly ahead of schedule, I don't see at this point a lot of shuffling around of acres. But the big story pretty much uh, weighing over the market as a whole is, is China, right, as far as they have the cards right now. Right. China's, China's really always the big player, and, and that's kind of the status quo. Um, and, and I see that probably continuing in the future. Well, time to check out our trivia quiz for this week. And this week, it is about the livestock sector in the state of Mississippi. And here's your first look. How many goats are there in Mississippi? Is the answer 14,000, 20,000, 27,000, or as many as 35,000? Stay with us for this answer. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span says there's downside worry in the cattle market. In the feature segment today, most research facilities are off limits to the public, but there's one at Mississippi State in Starkville that wants visitors. It's the MSU Trial Gardens. They say this is the information age, where people can instantly find any answers they're looking for. Yet 
so many of us still can't figure out how to feel better. Well, here's a suggestion, eat better. And what better place than a Mississippi farmer's market to help you do just that. Locally grown fruits and vegetables are healthy, picked at the peak of quality and freshness to help you feel better. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the farm week calendar. Especially crop farmers can learn to build or improve their online presence and they can learn some marketing strategies on Friday, May 20th, that will be held at the PL88 Farms. That's on Highway 84 at Prentice. There's no charge for this workshop, but you are asked to pre-register. The hours are 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. You'll learn how to use social media and the internet to process payments and improve customer relations. You'll also tour the farm's vegetable and watermelon production. The Beef and Forge Field Day will be held Saturday, May 21st at Tylertown. It takes place at the Livestock Producer Sale Barn on Highway 98 east of Tylertown. Starts at 8.45 a.m. New vaccination regulations and low-stress animal handling will be on the agenda. The top performing bulls from the South Mississippi Gain on Forage Bull Test will be on display. They will also be available for sale. There's no registration fee, but you are asked to pre-register for lunch. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. The immediate reaction of the cattle market to the supply and demand numbers on Tuesday afternoon was to close lower. In a nutshell, the sharply higher grain prices sparked by that WASDE report basically put the brakes on the recent rally that had been occurring in the cattle market. Analyst Ted Seifert says he was already worried about what may be happening in another four to six months in the beef sector, even before the developments this week. I mean, we, we basically given uh, incentive to add placements. And now, now that we've done that, I don't know if that incentive still needs to be there. So I, I'm a little bit more friendly live cattle than I am feeder, but overall I do think we can have a shorter term rising tide in both cattle markets. Longer term, I'm a little worried about uh, the downside potential that we still have out there. Keep in mind, we, ta we trade futures, not today's, right. Right? right? So, you know, we're always trying to think one or two or three steps ahead of, of what the market's going to do. Um, so in the near term, again, I, I felt like we needed to see a bounce. Mm -hmm. I thought 114 was a likely area to do it, especially when we put that double bottom in. I think we can get a bit more of a bounce, uh, but I think this is a bounce that is a selling opportunity for producers in general. Back to the trivia quiz now to wrap things up for this week in the markets. And the correct answer is B. The USDA says that as of January 1st, there were 20,000 goats in the state. That is an increase of 5% from the year before. No matter whether you're a novice gardener or one with years of experience, Farm Week has a place you need to visit. Make a trip to Starkville and spend some time at the Mississippi State University Trial Gardens. You'll quickly decide it's an excellent place to see plants that grow best in Mississippi and to see them in a realistic setting, much like your own backyard. Farm Week's Amy Taylor Meyer says it's a tough love kind of place. Tucked away on the Mississippi State University campus is a living resource many gardeners may not even be familiar with. As you would expect, you'll find all kinds of landscape and vegetable plants at the trial gardens. But there's also the unexpected, such as a camellia garden with historic plants from author Eudora Welty's home. Assistant Extension Professor Jeff Denny says everything is not perfect at a trial garden, and there's a good reason why. It is a trial garden. Um, it's not really a display garden. So as you walk around, you do see things that are diseased. You do see things that bugs are eating on um, because one of our, our philosophy with the trial garden has, has been to um, treat these things the way a homeowner does and so we manage it at, at a level that's, that's similar to what your normal homeowner is going to do and, and most of them aren't going to spray weekly for things and most of them aren't going to do all, all kinds of things. Uh, that There's lots of maintenance things that they could do that they aren't likely to do, 
Um, and so what we try to do is trial plants in, in a realistic environment so that if it looks good for us here, it's going to look good for you in, in your home. Denny says the landscape bedding plants here come from various commercial breeding companies around the world. He explains one goal of the trial gardens is to spark the interest of young adults. Their traditional market is baby boomers and baby boomers are starting to age out of gardening. Um, and Generation X doesn't really garden a whole lot and so we're trying to help them learn to market to a younger audience and we're also trying to help that, that younger audience learn how to use the products that the, the green industry produces. The trial gardens also demonstrate vegetable production as well as growing in containers. Other interesting features involve growing new magnolia varieties and showcasing camellias from Eudora Welty's home in Jackson. There's a lot of excitement in the magnolia breeding community because there's a uh, magnolia that we have that um, they're, they're, they think that maybe they can get a, they can pull some red colors into southern magnolia. So maybe we get a pink or a, a red flowered southern magnolia at some point. We also have, we're the repository for the Eudora Welty Camellia Collection. Um, and that's something that came to us through uh, the Landscape Architecture Department here at Mississippi State. They've helped redevelop her garden. They've been reinvigorating that. Um, and one of the things that they decided that they wanted to do was back up all of her plants um, so that if something happens, they can replace with her exact plants. This is the only other place that you can go in the world and see Eudora Welty's camellias that aren't at Eudora Welty's house. Another goal involves sharing information by conducting tours for conference groups, schools, commercial breeding companies, and anyone else interested in gardening. Located on the MSU campus at North Farm, the gardens are maintained by students and faculty of the Plant and Soil Sciences Department. Those students say they love the experience the garden provides them. It's a really relaxing environment after a long day of stressful classes, and I get to do what I love being outside, being with plants and trees and flowers and helping keep them look beautiful. I plan on going into industry hopefully or graduate school and I'm more interested in the research side of things which I do get to do out here also because we get to trial different plants and see how they grow and I'm interested in the genetic side of things so coming up with new varieties of plants to bring out here was like one of my ultimate goals. My main uh, master's thesis has to deal with uh, cold hardy bananas. There's not a whole lot of tropical landscapes in, you know, let's say Mississippi or, you know, people don't push the plant as far as it could possibly go to where we might find cold hardy bananas that can work. You put one of those in, you know, a plain, a plain flower bed and the entire look has changed. Our daily task here includes spraying, uh, Roundup, you know, edging the uh, the flower beds and weeding. And this year, I think the sweet potato vine trial has has been the most popular. I guess because it's just so bright and so big. When certain problems uh, come up, say like um, when we're mowing and like we hit a pipe or something, uh, you know, we do a lot of teamwork when it comes to uh, you know getting it up and assessing what the problem is and like. You know, trying to fix it as soon as we can because then we don't want other problems to occur. You know, say it's flooding or like, you know, other irrigation to, um, you know, stop working. Anyone can come out to come see the trial gardens. I mean, I've been here for almost maybe two years and just seeing the broad range of work that we've been able to do and implement from magnolias to, um, I helped with the, our vegetable trials that we did and just all the different types of plants and I'm hoping that more and more people will come see how beautiful it is and just come visit Mississippi State University. The goal is to um, show them that, you know, the industry that I service has products that, that are useful and interesting. We love it when everybody leaves and goes, oh, well, I could have done that. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, what we're, that's what we're after is we, we want to kind of take some of the magic out of it, you know, the, the, where it's not, it, it's not intimidating. Since beginning in 2013, the MSU trial gardens have been dedicated to identifying, evaluating, and promoting plants that excel in Mississippi. Faculty and staff say they'll continue welcoming all visitors, whether they come for knowledge or just want to see something beautiful. From Mississippi State University, I'm Amy Taylor Myers reporting. You can watch this story again on the Mississippi State University Trial Gardens on our Farm Week website. 
Our Facebook page or YouTube, the gardens are located at 60 Technology Boulevard in Starkville. That's next to the MSU North Farm. The gardens also have their own Facebook page. Our website address is farmweek.msucares.com. Now, Leighton, the gardens are hosting a workshop on Tuesday, June 14th. It's called Floral Designs from the Garden. Participants will learn how to create beautiful arrangements from their own landscape plants. The cost is $25. The evening workshop runs from 6.30 to 8.30. Takes place at the Dorman Hall Greenhouse. Pre-registration is required. Go to the Trial Gardens Facebook page for more information and phone numbers. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we'll look into some research into integrating robots into agriculture. Many prototypes of agricultural robots are complicated, but you'll see how one Australian company is developing ag robots that are simpler and less expensive. In the food factor, portion control will have some guidelines to help you control how much you eat. And in southern gardening, spiller plants. They add the kind of excitement you'll want in your flower pots. And if you'd like further information on a Farm Week story or you want to suggest one to us, you need to get in touch. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube. Our mailing address, Farm Week Box, 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi. Well, for the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.